Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the latest edition of the HDO webinar series. My name is Lewis Miller, and I'm the Assistant Director at HDO. Today, we are joined by Dr. Art Markman, a professor of psychology and marketing and the director of the IC Squared Institute here at UT. He also teaches in HDO's master's, bachelor's, and professional training programs. Dr. Markman is here to discuss how to use cognitive science to get a job, do it well, and advance your career. He will illustrate these topics with stories drawn from interviews done for his new book, Bring Your Brain to Work. A few notes before we get started. Please mute your microphone and turn off your video during Dr. Markman's presentation. And if you have any pressing questions or issues during the session, feel free to send any HDO staff member a private chat. We're listed as name at HDO in the list of participants. At the conclusion of the presentation, there'll be approximately 15 minutes for Q&A. I'll now turn things over to Dr. Markman. I hope you enjoy the session. Hey everybody, uh, hope you can hear me. And uh, so hi, okay, sorry about that. We had a little technical difficulty here in the room. Um, this is Art Markman and uh, great to be here. Thanks so much for, for attending. Um, what I wanna do today <clears throat> is to, to talk about, um, uh, to talk a little bit about your, uh, how you can use cognitive science to help you to understand what's going on uh, with your career. And so let's start by, by recognizing that the career uh, cycle involves uh, getting a job, uh, doing well at that job, and then, uh, and then thinking about getting the next one. And, and the cognitive science is the discipline that, that mixes psychology, neuroscience, uh, philosophy, education, anthropology, computer science. And the reason that I like to bring these two together is that if you think about what it is that allows you to succeed in the workplace, many of these, uh, many of the skills that you need in order to be successful are things that you actually never took a class in order to learn how to do. So no matter what you may have majored in when you were in college, no matter what sorts of, of, uh, of other additional degrees you may have gotten, um, those skills may have helped you to do some of the technical aspects of the job that you're doing, but they probably didn't help you with a lot of the other factors that drove your ability to engage with other people, to work with clients and customers successfully, to, uh, to, to, to take on leadership roles and things like that. Now, I was reminded of this, uh, actually, when, when having a conversation with my oldest son, uh, Soon after he took one of his first jobs, um, he called me up and he said, listen, I, uh, I, one of my colleagues yelled at me today uh, because I had told something to a client I wasn't supposed to, um, what should I do? And, and I realized in that moment that no matter what classes he had taken in school, there wasn't really a course or an assignment <clears throat> that prepared him for dealing with that particular situation. And so um, I'm going to tell you what he did and, and what the outcome was later. So that'll give you a little cliffhanger. But I think the main point to recognize is that, that navigating those kinds of situations successfully turns out to be extraordinarily important in determining whether you're able to move forward effectively in your career. So the fact that you haven't learned things uh, about in classes that you've taken and in other places to help you to deal with these situations doesn't mean that there isn't research and aren't topics that could help you. This field of cognitive science actually has a tremendous amount of information that is useful for understanding the people around you. And in particular, it's useful for understanding your motivation, uh, it is useful for understanding your social interaction ability, and it's useful for understanding your cognitive ability, your ability to think through problems. And each of those plays a role at every phase of your career. 
<clears throat> so let's start just by thinking a little bit about what happens at the front end of your career, uh, at the front end of the job process, not really at your career necessarily, but at the point where you're looking for a particular job. Now, this could be the sort of thing that you're doing uh, when, when you're actually uh, starting a career path, but it could just be that you've made the decision to move on uh, to, to another career, uh, to, to either to another career or uh, to another job within your career. And so uh, that's the phase at which you're, 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 look, you're at the front end there. And I should say up front that it's important to recognize, uh, uh, it's important to recognize that, um, sorry, we're just dealing with some some technical issues here. Well, uh, apparently the video is not working, so you're going to have to look at the at the blank screen. Um, but uh, um, so so I, I would like to say up front that that I think that the information that we're talking about today is useful both if you are navigating your own career, but also many of you may be in the business of trying to help other people to deal with aspects of their careers. And so uh, even in that situation, I think that a lot of this information is quite relevant. Now uh, let's let's take that process of of looking for a job and think about some of the elements. One of the things, one of the bits of advice that we often give to people is uh, you should follow your passion. You should find that thing that you're truly uh, passionate about and that should be the thing that you do uh, for a living. And there are actually two fundamental problems with giving that advice. The first of which is <clears throat> that actually uh, the evidence suggests that people can learn to love all sorts of things uh, uh, related to their jobs, that it's not that you have to find something that right up front is, uh, is, is something that, that you're excited about, but rather um, you wanna find a job that, that has two characteristics. The first of which is that it is something that feels like it reaches out to something that's bigger than just yourself and bigger than just uh, the, the kinds of, of work that you're doing. And the second and perhaps more important is that your job really needs to be something that ultimately helps you to express some of your deeply held values. Now, there's a lot of work by Shalom Schwartz and his colleagues on a universal system of values. And that system of values <clears throat> identifies 10 values that we see across cultures in the world. And some of these values are things like uh, achievement. There are some people who deeply value being recognized for being successful. There are other people who value benevolence. They're, for them, what's really important is doing things to help other people. Other people value tradition. What they care about is their community, their connection to that community. And yet other people value hedonism, pleasure. They want to really enjoy the things that they're doing. And it's important for each of us to begin to recognize which values we hold and then to take that set of values and figure out how we might express those values in the career path that we're taking. Because what, one of the things that drives an enthusiasm with work and excitement with the work that you're doing is the feeling that you can express something about those, those deeply held values as a part of the work that you're doing on a regular basis. And so those people who feel like they're coming to work, living that set of values, and at the same time are connecting to something that's really, I think, bigger than just uh, the, the particular tasks that they're doing, these are the things that, uh, that help people to feel like they're on the right career path. Now, <clears throat> when you don't have that match, then you quickly find uh, that, that, that the workplace can be quite frustrating. And, and there's a whole process that I think people go through to determine what their values are and to recognize that those values can change over time. So for example, in, in the book, Bring Your Brain to Work, uh, that I'm basing a lot of this discussion on, uh, I, I, I use my social media connections to, uh, to reach out to people and get a bunch of stories. Um, one story uh, in the book involves a guy named Brian, who came out of college thinking that achievement was really something very important to him. He wanted to take a job that was prestigious, 
that, that, that his friends and his parents and other people would recognize as being important. And after doing that job for, for a short period of time, he recognized that actually this was not something he was enjoying at all. Uh, and, and ultimately left that job, went to the Peace Corps and, uh, and, and came back uh, later to, to do a job that really allowed him to express a very different value, one of benevolence, because that was actually something much more important to him. Now, not only does this happen to people uh, you know, early on in their careers, it can happen throughout the career path. So uh, another story in the book involves somebody who um, <clears throat> at, at late in his career recognized that he wanted to leave a very successful career uh, and, and ultimately go and run a nonprofit organization because his, his own values had changed. And so he felt like, while his, he had been very happy at his job for a long time, uh, there was really something else that he wanted to accomplish. So paying attention to those values, paying attention to the shift in those values over time, turns out to be an important determinant of people's happiness in the workplace over the long term. Now, as we begin to think not just about very broad issues about what sort of job might make you happy, you can also think a little bit more specifically about <clears throat> the, the role that cognitive science can play, even in some of the specific things you do in that process of, of trying to find a job. So for example, when you prepare your resume, uh, you might ask yourself, what sort of resume is most likely to appeal to hiring managers, to recruiters? And, and one of the things you might ask is, well, how much stuff should I put on my resume? And, uh, and one of the things that, that you find is, is, uh, is there's some interesting work by Norbert Schwartz and his colleagues on something that's called the presenter's paradox, which is, is kind of an interesting thing that can be applied to your resume. The presenter's paradox is this idea that when we're preparing to present ourselves to other people, we believe that we should throw in every single positive thing that we can think of. So uh, whether it's something really great, like, like a wonderful job that you had in the past, or whether it's something that's good but not great, like perhaps getting honorable mention at a, at a particular competition, we figure anything good should go on the resume. And the reason that we think of that, think, think it, that way is because we believe that when people are evaluating us, they're adding up all of the goodness uh, of, of the things that we have. And so anything that's good, whether it's very good or just moderately good, makes us better. But it turns out that when recruiters and hiring managers are evaluating our materials, they're not adding everything together. What they're doing instead is averaging across all of the things that, uh, that they see. And so what that means is that, that something that's moderately good actually brings the average down. So three great, great, great things, great thing, actually worse than just three great things. So if you have some amount of latitude about what you can present in, in a resume or in a portfolio, you should focus on putting only the great stuff in there and leave out the stuff that's good but not great. So this is a cognitive element. And, and what's important here is to understand that we're trying to understand both how we ourselves think but also how other people that we're going to be interacting with. And the last thing I want to say on the, on the, you know, in thinking about the, the getting a job process is that we should also pay attention to the social elements of this and to recognize that every interaction that we have with a firm that we might consider working for is telling us something about that firm and what it might be like to work there. So one of the interesting things that happens is we have a lot of habits around evaluation that we gathered through all of the years that we were in school, even if it's been many years since we were in school. So one of the things that happens is um, when you're in school, you're trying to impress uh, whoever's evaluating you, your, your teacher, who, you know, and, and, and so you're trying to do the best job you can in, in, in getting all the right answers. And, and that's perfectly fine in a school setting, but when you're in an interview setting, <clears throat> the interview is actually not just something where you're trying to be impressive, it's actually a place where you're also trying to learn about the place that you might work. They are communicating things to you about their approach and about their values in the context of that interview. So for example, 
<clears throat> suppose a firm asks you a question and you just have no idea how to answer it. The question has come from out of left field. Well, one of the things that you may want to do there is rather than panicking, you might actually want to engage in a conversation. Try and get a little bit more information about what they might have meant by that question and, and really try to work through that together jointly. Now, when you're taking an exam, you often don't feel like you can do that because it, often, you, you know, back when you were in school, you'd go to the teacher, you'd say, gosh, I can't, uh, uh, I can't, you know, if I ask a, uh, for, for help uh, with a question, that the, the teacher's just going to say, look, the question's there. Do the best you can to answer it. But when I'm in an interview situation, I'm in a situation in which, look, I'm not going to be 100% prepared for every single thing that faces me in the workplace. Workplaces are all about not just bringing your expertise, but growing in that job. Does this firm expect me to grow in the job? And if so, then perhaps engaging in a discussion actually allows me to see the way that this firm deals with growth opportunities. And so I'm learning something about the people I might work with in the process of this kind of engagement. So I think it's, it's really important <clears throat> to realize that most of these interactions that you have, even before you started working somewhere, have a social impact in which not only are, are you trying to be as impressive as possible, but you're actually learning something about the people that you might work with in the process of interacting with them. And this is true not just in the interview process, it's also true in negotiating with a firm after they've made you an offer. Are they willing to work with you and engage in some joint problem solving to help you to solve whatever problems you may have when you're, when you're trying to make sure you're getting the best possible offer, or are they being very rigid about that offer, in which case they're telling you something about the rigidity of their internal processes. So you're, you're constantly learning about the people around you when you're interacting with them, and that's also true in the process of trying to, uh, to actually get the job in the first place. So there's a few examples of how we can begin to use cognitive science in that process of, of actually thinking about getting a job. Now what happens when you're in the job and you're trying to succeed? Now there's a variety of different elements to that kind of job success that include things like learning while you're on the job, communicating effectively in that job, staying productive, and learning to become a good leader. And cognitive science helps us with all of those as well. So uh, one of the elements of, of any job is that there are going to be all of these kinds of growth opportunities. One of the things that happens to many people who get a particular job is that they suffer from a variant of what's called imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome is this idea that I have Put my, been put into a position that I don't deserve to be in. So uh, when I, and so as a result, uh, I'm constantly worried that everyone else around me is perfectly competent at what they're doing, but I'm the one who, who really doesn't belong there. And if people discover that I'm not supposed to be in the place where I am, then, then you know, I might lose the job or, or at least I might get shut out of possibilities of advancement. Now, part of what we need to recognize is that when you look at the performance of the people around you, what you see is what they're doing. You don't see their internal state. You don't see the struggles that they're going through. You don't see the degree to which they have concerns about whether they're doing the right thing. And so you make assumptions about the way that everyone else is approaching their work. In actuality, I think a lot of people feel like they aren't 100% sure what it is that they're supposed to be doing at any given moment. And so we have to realize that those feelings that we may have that we're growing into a position are actually the feelings that everyone has. And in fact, it's important to recognize that <clears throat> In general, if you are completely qualified for a job that you stepped into, you probably aimed too low. That is, you probably, uh, uh, you know, really should have provided yourself with, with a chance to take a job that would, that would allow you to, to grow into it. Now, the reason that imposter syndrome is such a problem is because if you believe 
that you're not supposed to be in this job, then one of the things you're going to try to do is to avoid giving anyone an opportunity to think you don't belong in that job. And that's going to create two problems. The first problem is that it's going to lead you to try to avoid making any mistakes. And, and the thing is that, that you have to often try things and, and success isn't really about never making mistakes or never failing at anything. It's your ability to recover from the mistakes that you make that actually determines a lot of your success. And, and that means that when you do make a mistake, you actually want to own it as quickly as possible, learn from it, and then figure out a plan to make it better. So to return to the story that I opened with, where I was talking about my, my oldest son who had a colleague who yelled at him, well, what did he end up doing? He had actually, uh, as what he told me was, um, <clears throat> he went to his boss, said this colleague yelled at me, and so uh, I immediately uh, apologized, figured out that I had told a client something that maybe I wasn't supposed to. I apologized to the client and I made a plan for how to, uh, to, 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 not, to make sure that that doesn't happen again in the future. Now, the interesting thing about that response was that, that paradoxically, by going to his boss and saying that he made a mistake, he actually increased his overall level of trust in the future rather than decreasing it. Because now his boss knows that she's got somebody working for her who will immediately come and talk about mistakes and turn those into learning opportunities rather than letting them uh, fester until there's nothing that can be done about them. And so the fascinating thing uh, and the fascinating danger about imposter syndrome is that it often leads people to hide those mistakes until after there's something that could be done about them. And so in fact, in general, it is best to try to use those situations in which you're not sure what to do as opportunities for learning, which means that if you're not sure what to do, don't hide that, ask someone, and at the same time, <clears throat> make sure that when you do make a mistake, that you take responsibility for that mistake right away and ask what to do. Now, if you're going to ask what to do, one of the things that you wanna do is to make sure that you have good mentoring in the workplace. And unfortunately, the modern workplace is actually quite bad at creating good mentorship. Most workplaces actually have a fairly inorganic way of doing mentoring in which someone gets hired and immediately upon arrival, they get a, a mentor and, and, and that mentor takes them out for coffee and you hang out for an hour and you have a perfectly pleasant conversation after which you never speak again. Because in fact, that mentor doesn't really have anything in particular to tell you. Rather than that kind of mentoring, what is better is to seek out not just a mentor, but rather a mentoring team that can help you to develop over the course of your career. And that mentoring team needs to include a number of different kinds of individuals. It, you need to find one person who is what you could think of as a superstar, somebody who has the career that you want. And that person is someone to just go out and talk to every once in a while and just listen to how they approach the kinds of problems that they face at work, how they have navigated uh, the, the, the various aspects of their career, and to just give them open-ended questions about what they're doing in order to understand their orientation to the workplace. Now you might think somebody who's a real superstar, why would they want to talk to you? But actually what you're doing is taking them out and asking them to talk about what is probably their favorite topic themselves. And furthermore, when people like that feel like they have a connection to you, they often continue to look out for you later in, in your career and perhaps bring you along because uh, they feel like they have uh, someone who would be an ally for them in future situations. Now that can't be the only person you have. You also need to have a good coach. And a coach is fundamentally someone who is not going to tell you how to solve your problems, but rather is gonna lead you through the process of solving that problem. Just like a, a baseball coach isn't going to go and bat for you, your, your baseball coach is gonna watch how you swing a bat and then 
correct that and help you to do it better. And you need someone who's willing to take the time to understand where you are in a situation and how to improve your ability. So you don't just want someone who's going to tell you what to do. You want someone who is going to be willing to teach you. <clears throat> you also need several other kinds of mentors. For example, you need to have somebody that you know within your organization who can help you to figure out where to go and who to talk to to solve various problems. The bigger any organization gets, the harder it can be to find the right person that you need to talk to within the organization who has authorization to do a particular thing. You want to find those people who are well connected and, fig and, and use them to find out who it is that you're supposed to talk to. So the idea is that you should constantly be looking out for other people around you to learn how to do your job better. And the reason for this is because we have to recognize that human beings don't come programmed with very much knowledge internally. We are able to solve the kinds of problems that we do, not because we have some amazing abilities that were pre-programmed by evolution, but rather because we have the ability to learn from the people around us. And so we shouldn't expect that we're gonna understand how to do every single thing when we first approach it. We need to have people who teach us. And on the leadership side, it means we need to recognize that when we're higher up on the food chain in an organization, that we can't simply expect that other people are gonna know exactly how to do things. A good leader is fundamentally also a good teacher someone who is able to help other people to both recognize that, that something needs to be done and also to understand how to do it. When, when you think about leadership, one of the, the, the big difficulties that people have is that they often don't know how to delegate tasks to other people. And they think of delegation as something to be done only under duress, like if I can't possibly handle what I'm doing, that's the moment at which I should try and find someone else who might be able to help me out. When in fact, people should be engaging in a process of helping other people to learn key elements of the job that they do from the beginning. That is teaching other people how to take on particular roles that are just beyond what they're capable of throughout the process of working with them so that when the moment comes where you need to delegate something to other people, you're already completely confident in their ability to do it because you've already walked them through the process of learning how to do new things. So if you're constantly in a mode of teaching, constantly in the mode of trying to, to explain to people how to do things and then give them opportunities to do those things, then you are helping them to take on the next set of responsibilities. And you shouldn't be the least bit worried that someone might then come after your job because as the old saying goes, uh, if you can't be replaced, you can't be promoted. So you should constantly be looking to have uh, to, to prepare another group of people to take over some of the responsibilities that you have. The other thing that's really important, both from a leadership standpoint and a productivity standpoint, is to understand what it is that motivates people to take action. And motivation to take action is fundamentally about finding a gap between the present and the future, and then having a plan that will enable you to fill that gap. So you as an individual, in order to be productive, should be trying to find reasons to be dissatisfied with what's going on at work. Because dissatisfaction is the recognition that the present is not as good as the future could be, either because there's something more desirable in the future that you could, that, that you could uh, accomplish, or because the, the present has some, some bad thing in it that you really need to take care of. And so that gap between present and future creates energy that could be used to do something. But in the absence of a plan, then that energy has nowhere to go. And just like in physics, where energy without any direction creates heat, what we want instead is energy with direction, which in physics is called work. 
Energy with direction psychologically means taking that gap and then having a plan, a set of actions that you can carry out that will enable you to address the issues that created that dissatisfaction. From a productivity standpoint, it means that we need to be thinking through what specific actions do we need to take in order to solve the most important problems in front of us and to make sure that we have some amount of time that we spend each day that is focused on the important actions and not just the actions that are in front of us. Otherwise, we run the risk of doing nothing but spending the entire day answering emails or dealing with the, the, the most prominent things that are in front of us, which means we need to keep a, an agenda that allows us to make sure we make a little bit of progress on key elements uh, that, that are gonna allow us to solve the big problems that we think are important at work. And from a leadership standpoint, it means that we need to help other people to see the bridgeable gaps in their environment, meaning to help them to see what they should be dissatisfied about, but then to marry that with your sense of what the plan should be in order to address those issues. And so good leaders help to motivate people by giving them a sense of the bridgeable gaps within their environment. <clears throat> now, before we take this over to questions, the third thing I wanna do is to think about this process, not just of trying to succeed at the work that you're doing, but also to think about the entire career path, where in fact, you want to uh, move forward in your career. Now, the first thing I want to address is that when, when you reach a point where you have some dissatisfaction about the job that you have right now, one of the things you need to do is to understand that dissatisfaction in a way that will allow you to determine whether you should move away, move on, or move up. And what I mean by those three questions is moving away means am I so dissatisfied with my career path that I really want to, to shift and do something else? Do I want to move on, mean, meaning move away from my organization, but, but maintain my career path? Or am I interested in moving up, that is seeking some kind of internal promotion within the organization? <clears throat> Let's start with the, the idea of moving away. Um, to return to what I was talking about at the very beginning, this set of values that you hold can be very important in helping you to understand whether the career path that you're on really is the right one for you. And at that point where you feel like you are not actually able to express that set of values that you, that you have, um, you may find that it might be best to think about moving to a different organization. Now, um, for some people, of course, that really isn't an option. Financially, they, they, they are tied to a particular job. Um, there are situations, though, uh, and, and in those situations, you may want to find other activities, working with, a, with volunteer organizations and things like that that might help you to express your values. But often you find that people um, do find ways to, to make that kind of career change, particularly if they have suffered some significant uh, uh, personal factor that makes them rethink aspects of their lives. So in, the, in, in, in my book, I, I had a couple of conversations with people, one of whom had a significant health scare, another of whom had a, a death in the family, and both of those caused those individuals to really rethink whether they were in the right career for them and ultimately gave them the, 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 the energy they needed to give themselves permission to make uh, a career switch. And in one case, that career switch actually involved taking a, a job that was going to pay much less money. And so there had to be a kind of family meeting that went on to really make sure that, that, uh, that everyone would be willing to move forward living with, with fewer resources. And so, um, so, so there, there is a, a whole process you, you can go through to make the decision, which is a very difficult one, to, to move on to a different career. Now, uh, when you begin to think about, well, I, I enjoy the career path that I'm on, now you have to ask yourself, how do I feel about the organization that I'm working for? And, and the decision to move, uh, uh, move away from that organization uh, might be 
uh, might come when uh, uh, might come, so, so, so the, the decision to move away might come because you feel like the organization no longer shares your values. So even though you enjoy the work that you do, you enjoy the career, you enjoy the kind of impact you can make, you may not feel good about your organization anymore. That might be one reason to look away. But another reason to look away might be just that, that as you move up in organizations, there are fewer and fewer positions within the organization. Uh, and so you may have to move uh, to another firm in order to, uh, in, in order to achieve that goal. But one of the things that's really important is that if you do decide to move to another organization, bear in mind that every interaction that you have with people influences your relationship with them. And it is important to maintain a good relationship with the people that you worked for. In the modern economy, people are not staying at a single job at a single firm for as long as they did uh, many years ago. And what that means is that with this degree of movement, there isn't really a stigma associated with leaving one firm and going to another. And so you want to maintain a good relationship for two reasons. One, because if you stay in the same industry, you may find that you actually want to cooperate with your old firm on a project in the future. And so it's useful to have that good relationship. The other thing is that there's, there's now a term of art in, in hiring called the boomerang employee, in which you have somebody who went away, took a job somewhere else, and then they come back later. And uh, uh, and, and get rehired at the place where they were working. Well, you, you can't be a boomerang employee if you burn all of the bridges to the old organization. So you really do want to maintain that good relationship with people. If you're looking internally for uh, promotions within the organization, I think it's useful early on to take those people who are likely to have an influence on uh, that career path and, and and let them know what your hopes are for the future as early as possible. Those people can be great mentors for you to help you to prepare for uh, a future job. They can also be on the lookout for opportunities for you. And they may even think of things that, that you haven't thought of. One of the things about any aspect of thinking about the future is that our ability to think about the future is strongly constrained by what we know about the past. There's beautiful research on creativity that, that makes this point. There are a number of different studies by different researchers. For example, Tom Ward has done studies in which he's asked people to draw creatures from alien planets. And, and interestingly, the creatures that people draw bear striking similarities to uh, creatures on Earth. They tend to be bilaterally symmetric. So they've got, you know, the same limbs on each side and they tend to have the similar kinds of sensory organs, eyes and ears and things like that, even though they might have, you know, 12 eyes or 14 legs or something like that. And so our ability to, to even do something very creative is constrained by what we know already. And the same thing is true as we plan for future elements of our career we are constrained to think about jobs that we're all that, that already fit with things that we've heard about before but other people may actually be able to point us in a direction of things we haven't contemplated before and and so by by allowing other people to know that you have the intention of trying to move up you are actually giving other people permission to think about you in the context of other positions in ways that might actually bring opportunities to you that you would never have considered for yourself before. So you want to engage people in that process. And when you engage people in that process, they often take on a certain amount of feeling of responsibility for you, which can actually benefit you as you try to move forward inside of an organization. Now, the last thing I want to talk about uh, before, we, before we do open this up for questions is to bear in mind that not every decision to leave a particular job is a decision that you got to make. So unfortunately, <clears throat> there are times where the economy goes sour and, and you may be downsized uh, or, or perhaps uh, you, you, you made a mistake or, or some other thing and, and actually lost the job. And, uh, it's important to recognize that when you uh, 
uh, when you do suffer a job loss, for one thing, there is a grieving process that goes on. The emotions that we experience are, are a reflection of our motivational system. And when you're deeply engaged in something like you are with your career, then losing a job really hurts because um, you know, when, when, when you're not very motivationally connected to something, you don't have a strong uh, reaction to it. So, you know, if, if, if you, uh, you know, for those people who didn't care very much about the recent uh, uh, World Cup in soccer, the recent Women's World Cup, if you're not a particularly big soccer fan, finding out that the United States na uh, Women's National Team won might have made you smile, but you probably didn't dance around your home. Whereas if you were a huge uh, soccer fan, then you might have actually had a much stronger reaction. And the same thing is true when it comes to the workplace. For, you know, for many of us, uh, work is deeply bound up with our identity. It's one of the reasons why when you meet someone new for the first time, one of the first questions you often ask people is, what do you do? Because of this expectation that the work that they do is a deep part of who they are, which means that when you lose a job, it strikes very deep at your identity, at who you are and you're going to experience a lot of pain of loss, which means don't feel like you shouldn't feel stunned and sad and angry and go through all of those elements that are traditionally part of grieving when you've lost a job. It, 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 so, so give yourself that permission to, to feel those negative feelings, but slowly also begin to formulate a plan for moving forward. And one of the things that that means is you have to take a real, make a realistic assessment of what went wrong. So even if you lost a job because your firm no longer could stay in business, you have to begin to ask yourself, are you working in an area where there's going to be increasing competition from other countries or perhaps increasing automation that might make your job more scarce? So is there some retraining that you need to take on? And of course, if your job loss also involved some mistakes that you made, are there things that you need to learn in order to be prepared for that next job? So you really want to use the, the, the job loss as, a, as an opportunity to learn about how to move forward. And then you're going to re-engage in, in the, the job search process, recognizing that it may take some amount of time to find a, a new job. And I think it's really important in those circumstances for people to um, remain active. That is not just sit at home and wait for someone to call, but rather to actually do something. These days, there are two potential things to do. One is that, that uh, a lot of temporary employment agencies actually hire highly skilled workers to go into jobs for short periods of time. In the past, I think people tend to think of temp agencies as being uh, uh, primarily a place where very low skilled workers could get jobs. But these days, actually, a lot of temp agencies are, are placing people who are who have a, a much greater, a much larger skill set. That's one way of trying to remain active. And another is actually to engage with nonprofit organizations as a volunteer and to bring your skill set to help them. If you're, if you have a lot of facility in the back office of something, then, then work there partly because it gets you out of the house doing something, it keeps your skills sharp, but also because a lot of the people, the other people who engage with nonprofits are often people who might be able to help you to find a job uh, in, in, uh, in your field. And so by being out there and being part of a community, you are actually putting yourself in a position where you can get a job. And, and, and the reason for this is because there is a tendency um, to, to think that a lot of the job application process is about telling people what you can do rather than showing people what you can do. And this is true, you know, so, so one of the nice things about, for example, doing something like volunteering in an organization is that it allows you to show people what you're capable of, which might actually lead to a job down the line. And you can do the same thing in the interview process. And this is something to bring things full circle a lot of times people will go into the interview process and say things like, I'm a, I'm a self-starter. Um, well, that's a nice thing to say, but, but actually 
you know, when you go to do an interview, you should be over prepared for that interview. You should know as much as possible about that firm before you walk in, what it does, how it's doing, what the job is like, using resources, online resources, places like Glassdoor and things like that, to know as much as possible. And the reason for that is because by being over prepared, fundamentally what you're doing is helping people to understand that you are a self-starter because you self-started even in the process of doing this at the interview. So the more that you can show people what you're capable of throughout your career, rather than uh, telling people what you're capable of, the, the, the more that they're going to, to trust in your abilities. So to take a step back from all this, I mean, I, I was trying to give you a flavor of the variety of ways that cognitive science can be used to uh, to understand elements of your own career path. But, but I think the overriding message here is that many of the things that are going to determine your success in the workplace really are things that you didn't learn when you were in school, but that doesn't mean they're not learnable. Many of them come out of the field of cognitive science, which unfortunately didn't make the cut when we were developing a science curriculum, most of us learn biology, chemistry, and physics, but we don't learn a lot of psychology or neuroscience or uh, anthropology. And as a result, we don't learn about a lot of the research that might actually help us to do our jobs more effectively. Uh, luckily, there's a lot of resources out there to, uh, to, to, to be able to, uh, to look at this more carefully. Um, I do try to give this information away as much as I can, so I, I blog for Psychology Today, for uh, Fast Company, for Harvard Business Review. I have a podcast and radio show called Two Guys on Your Head. Um, so I give this information away as often as possible. But if you want it in a in a uh, in, in a perfect in, in a kind of uh, single place, um, then then uh, you can also check out my my new book, Bring Your Brain to Work, available from Harvard Business Review Press. Where wherever you get your books, because that, that has all of this in one place. And with that, enough self-promotion for me. Um, I'm happy to take some questions. Uh, the best way to take those questions is if you'll send them on the chat so that people aren't talking over each other, that would be best. Um, and, uh, and I will start. Uh, so the podcast, somebody asked what the podcast was again. The podcast is called Two Guys on Your Head, uh, and it's found uh, in, in a variety of, of places uh, where you can find your podcasts. And as I say, I blog for Psychology Today and Fast Company. And you can find out what I've been writing on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn and places like that. Uh, and from the Q&A, we see best ways to talk yourself out of imposter syndrome when you experience it happening. So that's a great, great question. So if you find yourself feeling like an imposter in the workplace, I think there's several things that you can do. The first is just to recognize that you're experiencing that and that it's got a name, that it's actually a thing. And so um, once you realize that you are not the only one who has these kinds of experiences, even that alone can help. However, um, I would also recommend sitting down with some of the people that you work with, particularly some of your supervisors and saying, um, here are some of the places where I feel like I can improve in order to be able to do my job better. What do you recommend that I work on in order to, to get better? And what you're doing is actually creating partners to help you to overcome what you perceive as your limitations. And so that's a, that's a useful way of helping you out of imposter syndrome. Because remember, imposter syndrome requires that there be, that, that other people don't know how you feel about yourself. And so if you actually bring it out into the open, one of the things that you do is you remove any sense of shame about, about not feeling prepared for where, you're, uh, for where you are in the workplace, because now everybody knows that you, that, that you feel like you still need to grow into your job, and they can actually be there to help you to do that, because chances are they hired you for a reason. And that reason wasn't just that they thought you were perfect already. They hired you as much on your potential as they did on, uh, on what you demonstrated to them already. And so you, you really want to create partners in, 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 in growth and learning over the course of your career. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, yes, unfortunately, the video didn't work. That's true, and we, and we apologize for that. Um, 
let's see what we had here. Oh, how do you promote, you approach a potential mentor and ask for that mentorship? And that's a great question. And what I would say is, um, in, in most organizations, it's as simple as an email or better yet, popping your head into somebody's office. Um, I recommend actually making an appointment, just a 10 minute appointment with somebody or a five minute appointment. And I do recommend trying to do as much work face to face as possible. Human communication is really optimized for small numbers of people interacting face to face in real time. And the further away you get from that, the harder it is to communicate effectively. And I think we do way too much of our communication these days by email and by text and through Slack and things like that. So if instead we can just create opportunities for some face-to-face -face communication, we can often communicate better. And even having a small, uh, a, a very short meeting with someone in which you express why you'd like someone's help can often create a deeper relationship in the future because it's easy for someone to ignore an email or to brush it off, but in a meeting, you can engage with someone and they can see your enthusiasm for the work that you're doing and are often then more willing to want to help out. So just starting with a five minute conversation with someone and then asking them to, to sit down with you at a time that would be convenient for them and perhaps a time when, when they don't work most effectively. Most of us come to work <clears throat> and we work long hours. We work nine to five, eight to five, eight to six. We're, we're there for a long period of time. And the fact is, if you're in the workplace for eight hours, you're probably not getting eight hours worth of work done. There's a certain amount of what I affectionately call fake work that gets done all the time. And I think that what we need to do is to help to make that fake work time as productive as possible. And one way to do that is to find somebody who might want to serve as a mentor and say to them, listen, on those times when, when you, you know, you're not necessarily, you know, that would be convenient for you. Let's, let's sit down at that time. And that actually can allow a potential mentor to feel like they're being productive at a time when they might ordinarily not be so uh, productive. <clears throat> uh, so let's see. Uh, another question here from Jennifer, moving from corporate to nonprofit seems to be a well-beaten path. What do you recommend for, uh, for understanding the marketability of skills honed in a nonprofit environment? Uh, one of the growing recognitions that I've seen is that is that the nonprofit environment and the for-profit environment aren't as dissimilar as people uh, often think that they are. I mean, in, in some sense, a nonprofit uh, organization is not necessarily structured that much differently than a for-profit. Uh, and in fact, you know, some of the larger uh, non nonprofit organizations really are just big corporations that plow that you know, that don't take their profits. So, um, so what I would say is that I think actually the skills that you acquire in the nonprofit setting are often quite valuable in the for-profit setting. And I think it's easy to make the case for that in particular, because one thing that happens in small nonprofits is that you're forced to make sure that you get things done. And I think that, uh, that it's, it's, it's really important to, uh, to, to, uh, to, um, to, to, to articulate in a cover letter and in a resume your ability to complete tasks that get started, because I think that that's uh, um, that's something that 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 will actually I think impress potential employers. Um, uh, okay, so <clears throat> another question that's come up a few times is recommendations for how to present your work and your resume and cover letter when you're applying for promotion internally. And one of the things to say about internal promotions is that while it's useful to think about your resume and your cover letter for internal promotions, you should also be laying the groundwork for those internal promotions through the way that you work with people. Meaning that it is useful to get to know people in the divisions that you might want to work in and to uh, and, and, and to, to cultivate a set of people who know who you are and can uh, speak on your behalf. Because um, internal promotions are, are partly a matter of, um, of, of demonstrating your, uh, your success within the organization, but they're also partly about 
uh, whether people actually feel like there are, you know, whether, whether you have connections within the organization. So don't just scour opportunities internally and apply for things. Also find ways to get to know people who might be in that division uh, so that they can put a face to the name and to the materials. Now, um, of course, it is important to, to help people to, uh, to recognize the, the contributions you've made. One advantage that you have internally over external candidates is that you already speak the language of the organization that you work for. And many organizations have a particular language for thinking about the kinds of positions and the kinds of work that are being done. And there's a lot of what are called fluency effects where people feel better about information that is expressed in a language that's familiar to them. And so make sure that you, that when you talk about your accomplishments internally, that you talk about them in a way that, that makes use of the typical kind of language inside the organization so that people feel like they already understand who you you are from the way that you uh, presented the information. Um, <clears throat> another question that came up is uh, what, did, what, what to do with, with people who are trying to, um, uh, let's see, how, how can, uh, so, so how can we, how can we, uh, how can we think about uh, creating um, Oh, here's what, so, so here it is. Let's, let's talk a little bit about the Dunning-Kruger effect, which someone asked about. So um, <clears throat> one of the things that happens in organizations is that people are um, uh, often somewhat overconfident in their abilities. Um, and the Dunning-Kruger effect uh, refers to the observation that the people who are most overconfident in their abilities uh, tend to be the worst performers or at least the people with the least amount of experience. And that's because uh, when, you, uh, when you don't really understand how something works, you, you don't understand all of the complexities that are a part of it. And this is particularly important in the workplace when we think about new employees in an organization who want to be promoted more quickly sometimes than perhaps they should be. So when you are mentoring people who just come in, you may find that somebody's been in the workplace for 18 months and, and already they're agitating for a significant promotion. And one of the things that you need to help them to understand is, is not just to beat them down with, no, you can't have a promotion yet, but to begin to open up the, the, their eyes to the complexity of how the organization works, the kinds of problems that are being solved, so that they understand exactly how difficult it is to, uh, to actually achieve successful performance. So one of the things about the Dunning-Kruger effect is, that, that we want to make sure that those people who have the least amount of experience are slowly uh, brought into an understanding of, of the variety of things that have to be done in order for the organization to be successful. <clears throat> so, and, and here's a good question. Somebody talked about, you know, I'm trying to maintain a good relationship with the people you're working with when in fact people are working on a variety of different projects. And of course, um, you know, in, it's, it's interesting that, that even when there are open office environments, which you have are people who work nearby each other without working closely with each other. And I think one of the things that's useful is to find opportunities to engage with people in the work, uh, to find out what work that they're doing and to find out ways that you might collaborate. And again, I, I, I'm a big believer in finding ways to take advantage of the less productive times in the workplace. So for example, in many offices, people stick around until closing time on Friday afternoon, but there isn't a, a lot of productive work that gets done after about 3.30 on Friday afternoon. So if in fact there's a very slow time in the office, that's a great time to set up a time to sit down with a few of your colleagues that you have a, a passing relationship with, but don't necessarily know that deeply, and just have a conversation about what are you working on? What's some of the really interesting things that are happening? What are some of the big problems that you're facing? Just to see whether there are ways that you could um, collaborate on some things. And, and even if you end up in a position where you don't get to collaborate on something, you may still find that uh, 
that, 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 that just having a better sense of what other people are working on pays dividends because as you're working on a problem in the future, you might know who to call on uh, in order to help you to, uh, to solve a problem. <clears throat> okay, and uh, I, think, I think with that, we've, we've hit the top of the hour. And so uh, I'm going to turn things over to Lewis to say a few final things. But thanks so much for attending today. It was really a pleasure talking with all of you. And uh, feel free to reach out on social media uh, if you have any further questions. Always happy to, uh, to engage with people. Thanks, Art. Thanks, Art. That's all we have time for today. Thank you so much for joining us. For joining us. Uh, I will send a follow-up email to everyone that will include a recording of today's session, as well as information regarding our future webinars. Um, so, yeah, thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.